Hi everyone, Pastor Steve here. This is a uh, another uh, church from the Revelation uh, series that we have been doing on the seven churches. Today we're going to be talking about the church in Sardis, and um, we're just going to go through the clips here, and you'll find that that's in Revelation chapter three, verses one to six, and just giving you a little bit of a visual of what uh, this ruins the ruins look like in where this this church was and where this city was at the time of writing um sardis apparently had a massive earthquake around the year ad 7 17 ad that destroyed the city but it was rebuilt there have been ruins of a gymnasium and a jewish synagogue that have been found in this where this city once stood and this also was a place where apparently modern currency was born and they perfected the way how to separate gold and silver and it was more pure than anywhere else and so it was sort of like the birth of modern currency as we know it today uh these are some of the remains of the city that you if you go there and do a tour there uh, you'll see these different things there that are still uh able to be visited uh in this city uh, where this church was um they had like every other one of these cities, they had uh, different gods. Uh, there were there was a fertility god uh, worship here, and there was also gods uh, a god that they could go to for cures uh, and for protection and stuff like that. Um, and so this is where the church had to contend with and was up against at, at this part of uh, history of the church in the first century. So Revelation 3 verse 1 says this, and the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. All right. So before we get into too much of the rest of this about the church here, it talks about the seven spirits of God. Now, we all know that there's only one God and there's only God, the Bible says there's only one spirit. So what is all this about? Well, the number seven is symbolic. It's for, it's for symbolic, it's perfection. It's the number of God, which stands for completeness. This is the type of thing that this is talking about here. And Isaiah 11 verse two tells us that the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So we've got uh, that the, the spirit of the Lord's upon him, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge in the fear of the Lord. These are the seven things that that's talking about there, that this is how Jesus is introducing himself, that this is all who he is and, and uh, all ways of describing jesus and obviously god so um he's telling us that these are to the seven angels or messengers of the seven churches now some people believe it's referring to angels spiritually others believe it's talking to messengers like pastors or leaders in the church i'm not going to get into that right now it doesn't really matter one way or the other um, but the rest of the message we're going to try and explain a little bit of. So the church of Sardis has come down to history known as the dead church. And the end goes on to verse 2 of Revelation 3 and says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. All right. So they had a name for being alive, but they were dead. So this tells us that a church can have a reputation of being alive, the place where it's happening, but God's not found their works perfect before him. You know, um, that they're not really alive anymore. They're living on past history, past victories. And we all know that there are churches around like that today that once were thriving places of the Holy Spirit and people were being saved. Um, and yet now they're poor imitations of the past. They're just going through the routines and the rituals and through the traditional uh, forms of worship, whatever it was that they did in the past. 
but it's like God has sort of moved on because they've stopped worshiping him from the heart or stopped obeying him, whatever it is, they're not listening to him. Um, now that doesn't mean there can't be people within those churches that are not true Christians and even denominations within those groups that can, st- I've been to churches that belong to certain denominations and the denomination overall has seems to be going nowhere or is dying or is dead yet the churches that belong to that denomination in certain places they're, they're full of life so it's 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 letting us know though that we can think that we're okay when we're in fact god can't find a heartbeat there if you like so what are the signs of a dead or a dying church all right so some of the signs i came up with um it's a church where people are just going through the motions where there's no heart in it anymore they're just turning up on sundays and the events that the church does but there's no real heart for it um it, it's like they're watching the clock their watch or they're <laughs> on the mobile phone these days um seeing how long before service finishes before they can go on to something they really want to do um it's where the people are not being saved from sin now it's 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 a, such a tragedy but there are many people in our churches today right across the spectrum of all the denominations who are not being saved from their sins because they're not being told uh, what they need to do. I mean, they're not being given the full gospel. They're not being told that they need to repent. They need to confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Some of them, they just think if they go to church and be a good person and do, try and do the right thing, then they're saved from their sins or they're not sinners in the sense that they need to be saved from anything. You know, this this is one of the sad realities of some churches today. A dead church or a dying church has begun to stop teaching the full message of the Bible. So they they might use the Bible, um, but they're not teaching the full message of the Bible anymore or they're not living that out anymore. In some churches, there's no call to repentance or change anymore. Um, you just join the church and become, it's like a social thing. You know, as long as you're not doing too badly, in different ways, you're, you're, you're fully accepted as a member of that church without um, any need for conversion, I guess is the word we'd be looking for. There's no spiritual growth amongst the members. People don't grow in their understanding of God. They don't grow. Uh, they're not bearing fruit. It's the fruit of the spirit that you find in Galatians chapter 5. They're, they're, there's nothing there. There's no burden to reach the lost. To reach those who don't know Jesus, uh, there's not there's there's no sacrificial living, there's no sacrificial giving, and I'm not just talking about finances, although that also plays its part. And the desire for God has been lost, or has become empty. And these are signs that your church is dead or dying, or that you are dead and dying spiritually. And this is what Jesus was trying to address here. He's saying you can't live on the past only. Whatever happened 20 years ago, you need to have a renewed commitment and refreshed encounter with God today. And you need to be, you know, alive in Christ today. It's not what happened 20 years ago that's the only thing that matters. So we'll have a look at chapter 3 and verse 2 to 3. We've already said about being watchful. So um, Jesus is telling us that we need to wake up. We need to become watchful. Strengthen the things which remain and repent. These are the things that he's telling us to do. Remember, therefore, we what you've received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come unto you upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come unto you. So he's being straightforward with this church. You know, they had that reputation. They thought that they were in the right place. Everybody in town thinks that this church is a real Christian church and maybe they still believe the same, the truth of the doctrines, you know, that that Jesus is the son of God. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead and they may be even holding to different doctrinal things, but there's no life there. There's no Holy spirit there. They're just going through the routines there. There's nothing happening there. And it's like Jesus is saying, it's time to wake up guys, wake up, become watchful. And then to strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die. And that's the challenge for us today. Is there anything that we need to repent of as a church? 
or as individuals, then God is calling out to us to awaken up. So how do we prevent or stop spiritual death? Well, we need to get on our knees. We need to get on our knees before God and get back into his word. We need to be involved in the church. You know, that the average church person thinks that coming to church once a week and, and in, in some cases once a month is all that really God requires of you. And, you know, you just come when you feel like it. Uh, you know, you, you, you shake hands with the pastor, you, you, you nod to the pastor's message and stuff like that. But that, if that's all that is, then you're not really alive in Christ. You're not really living out your faith in the world anymore. Um, we need to start back from the place where we've fallen. Remember when we first became Christians, I can remember myself when I first came to the Lord. I read through the Bible in six months. I read it every day going to work on the train. Every afternoon I was coming home and I was hungry to be in church. I remember the first time that I was the first weekend I came to church, the, the Sunday night that I became a Christian. Prior to that, I was the person that was picking me up for church was a little bit late. And I remember sitting out the front of my house and praying, God, don't let them forget me. You know, like that's the type of hunger and desire that we need to have to not be a dead church or not to be dying. And in the, as I've said here, the leaders, they must be the first to do that, lead by example. Um, the requirements for us church leaders is that we must teach and live out the word of God in our everyday life. It has to begin there first. Before we can expect our churches to come alive in Christ, be full of the spirit, being uh, hungry for God, then the pastors and the leaders in the church have to have that first, have to be like that first. And we have to have a heart to reach the world with the gospel. It's one of the reasons why our church goes out every Thursday. We give out free food to people, but we're not going out there just to give the free food out, though that's a good thing in itself. The whole goal and the whole aim of our street ministry is to preach the gospel with people, to share the faith with people, to share our testimonies of what Jesus has done with us, to pray with these people, to give out the word of God, a Bible to them or a gospel or some other Christian literature that might help them in their journey to faith. Acts 13, 22 says that David was a man after God's own heart. And that's what God wants from us to be like. And if we will do these things that are on your screen now, and get it into our hearts, then we won't be a dead church. We won't be a dying church because the life of the spirit will be in us. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit too, by the way. Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the spirit. Um, we need to, you know, experience and encounter God afresh. Verse 3 and 4, we've just talked about verse 3. Verse 4 says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will blot out his name from the book of I will not block out, sorry, I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then he always finishes, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's just what he says to every church. So none of us know the day or the hour when um we're going to die or when we're going to have to face God or when the end will come for this world. Um, therefore, we must prepare ourselves. Don't be caught out unawares. Uh, you know, like there, there are so many Christians today who, for all intents and purposes, are dead in their faith. There's no life there. There's no enthusiasm there for God. They're more interested in what's happening in, in the sports on the weekend and they're watching their favourite team than they are attending church and um, reading their Bibles and so forth. So we've got to prepare ourselves to stay alive, to stay close to God. Um, what happens when we do not heed the word, word of God? His warnings to repent and obey his commands. Then it's, it's like what he's warning here. You know, like he'll come and, and uh, you know, like your, your name will be blotted out of the book of life. Yeah, in, there are some... Christians and some churches that teach that once you're saved, you're always saved. Um, now, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to sound the alarm that, you know, like if you sin against God, then you've lost your soul and stuff like that directly. But, you know, like they, 
there, there comes a time when we can backslide away from God and we can lose our way. And, uh, you know, it says that those who hold on to the end, they're the ones that will be saved. Yeah, those who do the will of the Father. Uh, we have to make our call and our election sure. We can't just think that we're going to just get by with a so-so type of faith, which is half-hearted faith. That's where God is saying, if not found your works perfect before me. You know, we don't want God to say that to us. So we must heed his warnings that um, to repent. Otherwise, we'll, God will come to us and we'll be taken by surprise. So let's not play around with, with this and let's take our walk with God seriously. He says he will come as a thief in the night. So as I've just said there, when we, often, when we ignore God, we're, then, we're often surprised when things go wrong and we're not ready, we're not prepared. You know, we thought everything else was going to go on as before and then all of a sudden our world collapses. You know, COVID-19 took everyone by surprise, the whole world. No one expected it. The world was taken by surprise. But let us not be like that when God comes to us to give us, we, we have to give an account to him or when we're called to do something or, you know, when something happens that we're not caught unawares, that we're not um, prepared for whatever Jesus is wanting to do in our lives. The garments he talks about here is their symbols of being right or, or not right with God. Um, so we need to keep our life undefiled and pure. Um, God is holy and he wants his church to be holy. He doesn't want his church to be full of sin and full of uh, corruption. He wants it to be a pure church and he's calling us to that. Uh, and if we're alive in Christ, that's, those type of things will happen as he works in our lives. And again, as I said, he, he who overcomes shall have his name in the book of life. Now, again, there are times when we need to talk about the love of God, the grace of God, and the forgiveness of God. And our church is big on that. But there are also times when we need to talk about the judgment of God. And as we talked about the book of life in this few verses here, in the last part of Revelation and Chapter 20, I'm just going to quickly open that up. It says that, um, that there is a great white throne and him who sat on it and who, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and books were open and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his work. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I'm not going to get into all that, what that entails. There's Some of that is symbolic language there. Um, but the fact is, there's a judgment coming. We're all going to have to stand before God, and we are going to be judged according to what we've done with Christ and his word. And I don't want to be one of those ones that's not written in the book of life. The, the, the second death is a real thing. And there's a place of judgment without getting into it too much. Um, but we as Christians ought not to be fearful of that because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're, we're saved from our sins. We want to be the overcomers. Um, let us pray that our names are found in the book of life and hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. So that's the, the church that's at, um, at uh, not Thyatira. This was the church that was, sorry, at Sardis. Lost my train of thought there. But uh, I hope you will have a read of that for yourself. Go and have a look at what it actually says. And uh, God bless you in your study of the word of God and in your walk with the Lord. I'm Pastor Steve. Have a good day.